Hmm. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is going to be an interesting topic today, and uh, we see, I see there's people from all over the place, which is interesting. Um, thank you for joining us, and uh, we're doing a live Facebook uh, streaming as well as uh, on our Zoom platform. And this is the National Building Expert, uh, part of Ask the Building Expert series. And why do we do this? We do this to help building owners, associations, uh, condo associations, property managers, and anybody else who we can help. And although you know we've been giving these webinars for a while now, um, it's the first time that I'm actually able to talk about the subject matter that's in the um, photo that I have. It's me in front of the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. And uh, I'd like to introduce Martin Pea, who's the back uh, IT guy, uh, you know, cranking the cranks and uh, plugging in things and making sure our live stream works, our Zoom platform works, and he'll be um, asking the questions at the end that uh, people are posting on our Zoom platform uh, on our chat or Q and A, and if you're on Facebook Live, you can post your comments on Facebook, and you know we'll be able to uh, see it also. So let's get right to it. Um, this topic is the Millennium Story, the sinking building, and you know the Leaning Tower of Pisa that's in Italy. Well, this is a Leaning Tower in San Francisco, and I wanted to give you a little history about um, what's going on. And by the way, I normally give uh, generic topics and topics in general, such as roofing, uh, concrete spalling, cast iron piping, fire life safety. You know, those are generic or general topics. This is the uh, second one that I'm doing specifically uh, in regards to a building, a specific building. The first one I did uh, was concerning the Florida building collapse. And now this is the uh, second webinar I'm giving specifically on one single building. So uh, here we go. The history in San Francisco. San Francisco is a city by the bay, although there's a tower uh, that's sinking by the bay. And uh, my wife and I actually go to San Francisco or try to go at least once a year. So we're very familiar with Golden Gate Bridge, cable cars, Fisherman's Wharf, Pier 39, Chinatown, and all these, uh, you know, good places. And it's fun for us to act like tourists. Uh, I want to show you this photo on the top. And my wife and I are walking through Chinatown and these uh, street musicians came by and, and said, oh, you want to play? And they gave me this, uh, what looks like a banjo, but it's actually a Chinese instrument. So I sat down and started playing and they were playing Chinese version of Jingle Bells. And uh, I figured out how the tuning was and I was playing the lead and they were all surprised. Uh, little did they know that I'm actually a professional musician and I had no idea what instrument I was playing though because it wasn't a banjo, it wasn't a guitar, it wasn't a ukulele, it had like four strings. So I kind of figured it out. Anyway, they, they work for tips, but I, I think I threw like 20 bucks in their little jar there or something, but it, it was fun. And I haven't, I haven't been to San Francisco since the pandemic for two years, although my wife and I went this past uh, December, January for a week. And we, we own a property on Knob Hill. So uh, it's, it's fun, fun to visit. But anyway, the, the, the story goes with this Millennium Tower. The address is uh, 301 Mission. And it's at the north end of the Trans Bay Transit Center. There's this huge uh, transit center, uh, you know, for buses and all these other uh, 
modes of transportation, it, it's huge. But the Millennium Tower is like right next door to the transit center. And um, the tower is uh, about 640 feet tall, which is a super high building. And it's uh, 58 stories. It was actually uh, opened up uh, for sale or the residents moved in in uh, May of 2016. Uh, or, or actually earlier than that, 2016 is the date that the residents were notified that there was uh, a problem with the sinking. But let me go to the next slide here. Let's let's talk about uh, the the problems. Okay, the like I said in May 2016, the residents were informed that the tower was both sinking and, and tilting and leaning. And um, just to give you an idea of of uh, the value, the, a penthouse unit in this tower was sold in 2016 for 13 million dollars. So. As you can see, there's a lot of money being spent. Now, what were the problems from the start? Well, normally on a high-rise building, there's a peer review where uh, the engineers uh, talk to other engineers or they set up a peer review board. They look over plans and the specs and all that and, and say, uh, you know, it looks good to me. I think uh, you guys should go ahead and try from the start is there was no peer review because the developer wanted to save time and money. Peer review probably would take about two years. And so that's one of the problems. The other problem was that um, due to the location of where the tower is, really close to the, the bay, um, there's issues with the foundation of the soil. So normally you do soil tests, but if you're planning on testing the soil, you're not going all the way down to bedrock, there's no way you can test. The project was actually approved by the San Francisco Planning Commission and construction started in 2005. And uh, the interesting thing is this, the project was the first high rise built downtown in 20 years. So there was a 20 year gap. And that's why the developer didn't wanna wait any longer. He said, let's get the show on the road and let's start this uh, you know, project because there's you know, people that wanna uh, buy into a luxury high rise in the downtown area. And the downtown area is a favorable area if you ever uh, been there. So continuing on with the problems for the start, if you look at the image on the, on the left, you see a, a map and this is a map of, of downtown. And if you look at that red dot there, you see how close it is to the bay. So normally when you're that close and you're uh, you know, digging deep in the foundation, you're, you're not gonna hit anything solid, right? So in that area, uh, there was a lot of uh, fill material and it was basically a swamp. So you're, you're building all these high rise buildings in basically a swamp land. Uh, there's a lot of sand, there's a lot of soft uh, material and all that. And I, I put this image of sea lions because one of the, my highlights in going to San Francisco Fisherman's Wharf is going, going to see the sea lions and hearing them, and they're pretty loud. But you know they don't they don't care about a sinking building. All they care is about fish and lying down and you know getting some sun and then going fishing again. And part of the reason why they weren't around for years is because the bay. Uh, had a shortage of anchovies and other fish, so they ended up swimming up the coast to, to Oregon. But enough about the sea lions. We're here to talk about a sinking building. So there was design and engineering faults. And why do I say that? I say that because 
we we know now today that uh, there's a lot of planning and design that goes into high risk building, but if your foundation is not solid, then you're going to run into problems, right? So um, if you look at the image on the left, if you can see it on the top, you see graphs and then, you know, there's uh, topsoil, a layer of topsoil and settlement, partially weathered rock, and then uh, there's sand. And then at the bottom, there's solid rock called bedrock. And uh, the image on the bottom just shows you the different soil samples that are taken on any kind of development project. So any kind of high rise project that's being built and it doesn't matter where, there's normally uh, structure engineering and geotechnical engineering, civil engineering. Geotechnical engineering is a study of soils, geology. And that's where the engineer says, I wanna take soil samples uh, and he locates it on the plot map. And soil samples are taken. Why is it taken? It's because that engineer wants to know what the condition of the soil is. If it's really bad, then you can't build a solid foundation. So the structural engineer who's designing the foundation and the whole building wants that information. Otherwise, if they don't have it, you're building a, a structure on unstable ground. It's similar to if you're building a single family house and you don't test the soil, you just assume that it's good soil. And then all of a sudden the house is built and then it starts cracking and sinking. That's because there was no uh, soil testing done and you didn't know what the foundation was like, right? That the house is sitting on. So to continue on, this was the problem. The initial foundation of the Millennium Tower was built on a concrete slab that was uh, on 60 to 90 feet deep concrete foundation piles. Um, and the piles were actually through clay, fill, mud, and uh, sand. Okay, so if you look at the image on the top, the black is the building, the Millennium Tower, and all those little lines there are all uh, concrete piles. So it, it goes through, uh, you know, fill, clay, and then sand. So is, is sand solid material? Well, not really, although there's buildings that are built in San Francisco that are built on sand and they're not sinking or anything like Millennium Tower. So um, in uh, 2016, the building uh, sank like 16 inches and uh, there was a two inch tilt uh, at the base. And if you have a high rise tower, if a building's tilting, the top of the building uh, tilts more than the bottom, right? Because of the, of the height of the building. So in 2016, the base of the building tilted two inches which led to the top of the building leaning six inches, okay? And you might say, well, um, that's not that much. And it, it probably wasn't if it just stayed like that, but it didn't. Now, if you look at the image again, do you see the um, bottom of the top image and it's all like a dark olive green color? That's bedrock. So the problem here is that the building didn't have concrete uh, footing foundation piles from the bottom of the building all the way to bedrock. And uh, if you're, and you know, it's, it's very deep. So you're looking at uh, 250 feet. And of course it costs money to do that, but once your building sits on bedrock, it's not gonna move, right? So if it's sitting on clay or sand, that's not, not really you know, too uh, safe, right? And, and I'm talking about from the standpoint of engineering, okay? So um, that's, that's 
what it is now. And let me back up the um, the cost to the initial cost to fix the sinking and leaning building was estimated at about a hundred to hundred fifty million dollars. So let's say it's a hundred million dollars in relation to the cost to build the building, which is you know about three hundred fifty million dollars. So now you have a remediation fix that's about one third the cost to build a new building, and that's pretty substantial. Okay, and um, if you look at the image on the bottom left, it's just a uh, entire building that actually fell over because the foundation was bad. And then the other cartoon is, uh, is there cracks in the building? You didn't tell me about the cracks and the, you know, the buyer's saying that, and I guess the seller's saying, oh, what cracks? Speaking of cracks, okay, um, at a certain point um, in, in, in time, there were um, cracks. In 2018, there was like a popping sound and uh, creaking and all that. And it was determined that some of the windows are cracked. And normally in a high rise building, it's built with pretty thick glass that, that's not supposed to crack. And as you can see, this is the actual photo from the building. And, uh, you know, the cracks are, are pretty big. So um, when they did some more investigation, they determined that the, the cracks weren't due to uh, faulty glass. It was due to the building settlement during the leaning, tilting, and sinking. And then there was also uh, a bad odor. And why is that? Well, because the building was, was sinking and cracking, the foundation, the walkways all around the building was cracking too. And I visited the site about five times and I, I wanted to see for myself what this bad odor was. And sure enough, when I walked around, uh, it smelled like, um, have you have you ever been to New York where they got a lot of um, underground uh, subways and all that, and there's steam coming up, and so you get used to that kind of odor. But it it wasn't really that kind of odor. It was more of a uh, sewage exhaust kind of odor. And why, you know, was the odor there? Well. Whenever you have a high rise building, you have underground piping and it could be sewer pipes. It could be vent pipes. And when the building starts sinking, these pipes are getting displaced so they could crack and have these hairline cracks in it or pinhole leaks where odor can get out. So it's kind of a, a, a bad thing. And let me tell you that initially, when the building was built, they had, well, previous to the building being built, there were studies on how much settlement there's going to be, and every building is going to settle, right? Every building's built knowing the engineers know that this building is going to, going to move. It's going to sink a little. It's going to sway. It's going to move. But as long as it doesn't move that much. So on this particular building, the calculation was the settlement um, prediction was 5.5 inches in 20 years time. Okay, 20 years time. So when, when the building actually um, sinks more than uh, five inches, 5.5 inches, you know, in five years time, that's already a red flag. You're like, oh, what's going on here? Okay, so. What happens is, now eventually people don't, aren't too happy and they decide to, to sue. And that's where lawsuits come in. Now, speaking about lawsuits and, and litigation, the saying goes that you can sue anybody for anything for any reason. So anybody can sue anybody 
you don't even have to have a valid reason. And then you go to court and the court would laugh and go, this doesn't make sense. And they throw it out. But if there's uh, you know, valid reasoning for the lawsuit and it can be proven, then it becomes a stronger case. So um, there's so many different lawsuits that happen and everybody's pointing fingers at, at everybody else. So um, the uh, Trans Bay development, which is like right next door. Okay, so the Millennium Tower developer sues the Trans Bay development saying, because you guys started digging holes, a big hole in the ground to build your project and this and that, that caused the Millennium Tower Foundation uh, to fail, to sink and, and lean. Okay, so that was one lawsuit. And then the homeowner association sues the developer, okay, and the Trans Bay Authority. And then a different group of homeowners association sues the developer, Trans Bay Authority, and the city of San Francisco. Why did they sue the city? It's because the city has the you know, building department and they're the ones that approve the plans, okay. And then the city of San Francisco sues the developer uh, for withholding information regarding the building sinking. And basically it turns into, uh, you know, everyone suing each other. And then they come up with, well, you know, you should have been responsible and tell the uh, owners that the building's sinking. And, you know, you have an obligation to tell the general public also that your building's sinking. So uh, that was an, another lawsuit. And then um, the homeowner association actually files another lawsuit, uh, this time not only suing the developer, but all the, the architect engineers and everybody else. And the lawsuit was for $200 million. So, and that's in addition to the $100 million fix. Okay, so you got all these lawsuits going on. And then at one time it was consolidated and uh, it's easier for the courts to deal with one lawsuit than, you know, 10 different lawsuits. And that's what the Florida uh, uh, building uh, collapse uh, lawsuits got consolidated into one. Now, if you remember this uh, quarterback, famous quarterback, Joe Namath, he actually bought in Millennium Tower. And uh, Martin and I were looking at buying a, a condo unit in the building. And then before we, we could turn in our offer, we found out from the real estate broker that Joe Namath had bought the unit that you know we wanted. So we said, okay, um, you know that's fine. But what happened was Joe Namath, when he found out about the sinking building, he actually sued um, for 2.5 million or something like that. He basically sued for the price that he paid saying, you guys pay me the money that I paid to buy the unit and I'll give you the unit back. I don't want to live here anymore. It's, you know, bad news. So that's, that's what's happening or what happened. Now, continuing on with the lawsuits, um, I, I put a, a nice photo and it's an aerial photo. And if you can see, there's a Millennium Tower, you know, the top building and right next Door is the Trans Bay Transit Center. So when I was actually on site at the Millennium Tower, I could walk about maybe 25 steps and I'm right at the Trans Bay Transit Center, which the, the footprint of, of that project is way bigger than, than the Millennium Tower footprint. It's huge. It, it's like a whole city block, city block or two. Okay. And so this is a reason why the Millennium Tower developer sued the Trans Bay Transit Center and claiming that because you uh, started building your project and you had a big hole in the ground because you didn't take precautions, then our building started to sink. So, um, and uh, believe it or not, um, the city which funds the Trans Bay Transit Center contributed to uh, the lawsuit. And I think it was about maybe $30 million, something like that. 
But anyway, it's no fun. Once you have a major development project and there's lawsuits and everybody gets named in, in the lawsuit and uh, what happens is you have to basically prove to the court why you're not responsible, okay? Why you should be removed from the lawsuit. And what happened is the aggregate um, total insurance money that all these players had was still not enough to basically fix the building. So that you know becomes another problem. So let's talk about uh, the fix, okay? Um, I got some uh, you know pictures here about the sinking and leaning. So at one point in time, uh, the building was sinking 17 to 18 inches. And remember when I told you the uh, prediction for settlement was 5.5 inches within 20 years time. Now the building, you know, at this time was sinking 18 inches. So that's far, far cry from the 5.5 inches in 20 years. And also uh, leaning, uh, you know, 22 inches. So you basically have a high rise tower that's leaning almost two feet and basically sinking uh, a foot and a half. And it continues to sink to this day. And that's why there's a problem. So what, what is the fix? Okay, here, here's what the, uh, let me see. Okay, this is a photo of me standing in front of the Millennium Tower and then the larger photo is now you see the machine that's doing the uh, piling at the perimeter of the building. And why, you know, I, I was there in, um, in uh, late December, early January. And that's why, you know, wearing my cold clothes. And at that time they had a mass mandate that you have to, San Francisco uh, city, you had to wear masks. Everyone had to wear masks outdoors. And in the M Millennium Tower building, there was a mask requirement anyway. So to even get into the building, you had to wear a mask. So that's the reason why I had my mask and I have my warm jacket and my hat. So let's talk about remediation methods. So um, remember I told you about the building foundation that's in sand and it's not all the way into bedrock. Well, now the, the fix is gonna be, now we gotta install these perimeter piles. So um, in, in November of 2020, um, that's when the uh, perimeter pile uh, upgrade started. And remember in uh, June of 2021, there was a Florida building collapse. So at the time the Florida building collapsed, everybody, was so shaken up. And then the next item, after they got over the Florida building, they went to Millennium Tower and they said, whoa, your building might be next. You know, So there was a spotlight on the Millennium Tower. Um, so the fix was that um, they're gonna install 52 piles. Okay, so um, they started doing doing the work and let me see if I have another photo here. Okay, so the Millennium Tower perimeter pile upgrade. And um, so if you look at the, the small image on the left, so the idea was to install all these piles and it'll stabilize the building uh, on the side that it's, it's leaning and then over time, it'll kind of get the building to straighten out. So what's happening is that the plans called for 52 new peri perimeter piles installed, 22 along Mission Street, like the photo that I showed you, and then 30 along Fremont Street. So now instead of uh, you know the existing piles going into the sand, now it's going all the way into bedrock. So um, what happened in uh, um, August of 2021, okay, after 39 piles were installed, 
the building was still sinking and they did measurements and the building sank another one inch. And when the, a building sink, sinks one inch, the lean at the uh, top floor, the 58th floor uh, equals five inches. So basically a one inch um, uh, sinking of the building foundation equates to five inches uh, lean plus or minus at the top, okay? So what happened was after they installed 39 piles, the building didn't stop sinking. It was still sinking. So they put a hold on everything and said, well, uh, we got to revisit this idea. So it's like, did this, did this idea work or not? And by the way, the new perimeter piles were supposed to be tied into the existing piles. So you have a, a more solid foundation. So the actual fix wasn't, wasn't working. So in uh, February of 2022, the city actually um, went in and took their own measurements and they determined that um, there's a adjacent building uh, next to the Millennium Tower and it's actually their uh, uh, parking garage. And they dis discovered that the Millennium Tower moved one inch away from the parking tower. And that's pretty substantial, uh, uh, one inch movement. So um, that, that was pretty scary. So they took a time out and then they decided to revisit uh, and kind of go back to the drawing board and continue. So they decided to continue doing the work and you know reevaluate as more uh, perimeter piles are installed. So basically that's the gist of the story in a nutshell of what's happening. Is the building still sinking? Yes, it still is. And that's a conclusion. Uh, but I would say, uh, you know, keep following the story and it's always going to be, you know, on the news, especially in San Francisco. And it's one of these situations where no one really knew what would happen, but then when they found out what the problems were, then they decided to you know, come up with a fix. So who knows, at the end of all this fixing, they, they might end up paying you know, close to half or maybe one third of the cost to, to build the whole building. Now the building is not gonna fall over anything. It's just, it just needs to be fixed up. So basically, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to let you know, um, Ask the Building Expert series, and our website is askbuildingexpert.now.site. And we got so many webinars that we've given already on different topics. And um, we got other topics coming up, such as homeowner association design review, uh, what to do after a flood, contractor bidding, avoid the ripoff. We're going to talk about termites in another webinar, uh, window safety, mainly high rise buildings. Uh, we got some interesting webinars coming up on hazardous building materials, uh, defective building materials. And uh, I also have been following the story on the Grenfell uh, Tower fire that happened in London. And I was supposed to go out and uh, take a look at it a couple of years ago, but the pandemic uh, canceled all my flights. So I never uh, had a chance to go and, and visit. So basically we appreciate you guys tuning in. And I noticed that there's people from all over the world uh, uh, tuning in, India, um, France, Italy. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Now, uh, since that's the end, I'd like to get to the q and I think I got to um, wake Martin up. Maybe he got bored listening to my stories, but let's see if know, he's man. around and then uh, see what kind of questions uh, came up from the audience. Yeah, we have some questions, Lance. Um, interesting ones. And uh, let me hit you with the first one here. Uh, it says, I am a condo on a condo board. 
Isn't there a building code that says you have to build on a stable foundation? Yes, that's correct. There's a building code, and in in if you're from the United States, and most of you are, um, there's what's called the I. BC International Building Code, and that applies to every state in the United States, although different jurisdictions pass different years of code. And in Hawaii, although there's a 2021 building code, Hawaii is still on the 2018 building code because they haven't gotten up to speed yet. But um, the same way goes in foreign countries. They have their own building code. It's not called the IBC. It's called something else, whatever country you're in. But it's basically the same. The bottom line is that the building code states that you have to build your foundation uh, on solid ground. And um, this, uh, this building, Millennium Tower, was actually built on solid ground, so to speak, because when they submitted their plans, their plans got submitted by the San Francisco City Building Department. So um, they conformed to the code because they got their building permit. So um, hard to say what actually happened. Now, uh, maybe they shouldn't have gotten their uh, building permit. Maybe the San Francisco Building Department should have said, hey, if you're building this big of a building and you're that close to the bay, we want you to install your piles uh, to the uh, bedrock. And I don't care if you have to go 250 feet, that's what you gotta do, otherwise no permit for you. So, I mean, could that have happened? Maybe, did it happen? No, and look what's happening now. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Now, would, would this situation happen in, in other buildings around the world, chances are probably not, but it could. So if you're building on a high, you know, if you're in a high rise building and you're building and you don't have a solid bedrock to, to attach to, you're building to, chances are there could be some, some problem, this sinking, tilting, some deflection and things like that. So, um, why, why do buildings that are built in Hawaii, you know, why, how come they're not sinking or tilting? Well, they are sinking, but not to a degree like this Millennium Tower. Uh, every building is gonna sink, sway and, and move a little and it's designed for that. And uh, in, in Hawaii, especially why? Because remember Hawaii is actually um, made up of different islands that are made from uh, volcanic eruptions. So it, it's solid. And although you have uh, sand, eventually, if you keep digging, you're gonna hit some solid rock or a coral bed. So that, that's the answer. So the, the answer to the question is yes, the building code is there for minimum safety standards. And th those are met by the Millennium Tower Although there were, you know, problems, uh, it's obvious after the building permit was issued. So, got any other questions? Yes, we do, Lance, and and I have to agree with you that uh, even my even my residence is shifting, noticing that too. But let me let me hit you with the second question, which is interesting. Um, this question may be off topic, but how can a homeowner prevent a beachfront house? from sliding into the ocean. I think you've had some experience with this, yeah? Yeah, uh, a couple of months ago, I actually went to the site on the uh, North Shore and the uh, house had, had actually slid uh, into the ocean. And the problem is you cannot fool with mother nature or fight with mother nature and you know what, whatever you do, and that's just how it is on beachfront property. And not only in Hawaii, California and other parts of the world, there's, there's houses that are built on oceanfront and they're actually collapsing, uh, sliding down, sliding into the ocean. And what could you do? You could build you know, huge sea walls and that kind of thing, but it, it may not last. And 
especially in Hawaii, it's illegal to build any kind of seawall protection. So basically, uh, as a homeowner, you cannot cannot protect your property because the, the, the state owns the ocean and you can't build on state property. So there's a catch 22. When there's high waves, the waves are coming in on what you think is your, your land, but it's debatable because the high water mark on a high wave action, it is ending up in your property. So that's a debate altogether. What can you do? There's some people that installed illegal seawalls, they brought in big rocks, they shored up their house. But no matter what you do, if there's a lot of big wave action, king tides and all that, you're basically fighting a losing battle. And I've read studies on um, how to mitigate the problem. And the only way to do this is to move the house more inland. And how are you going to do that when you're on a 5,000, 10,000 square foot lot and you can only move your house so far? Uh, next thing you know, you're in the road already. So this is going to be a huge concern for people uh, that own oceanfront properties. In fact, Hawaii just passed the law. It's the first state to pass this law. And it, it's a real estate disclosure law that says if you selling beachfront property, oceanfront property, and you know there's a problem, you have to tell the buyer up front and basically tell the buyer, hey, when we have big waves, uh, part of our backyard is ending up in the ocean and part of our house is going to go too, maybe, or whatever. So it's just uh, becoming more of a, more and more of a problem, uh, global warming, climate change stuff. Uh, no, no matter what, uh, people can argue about it, but if you see these things for your own eyes, you know, flooding, uh, houses being uh, falling off a cliff or in the ocean due to global, global warming and high ocean, high waves and all that, um, you kind of have to believe those, those things, uh, people uh, saying these things. So- yep. I agree with you, Lance, actually. Um... My solution is don't live on the ocean, live in the mountains like us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we get a couple more questions if I can give you the next one. Yeah. And thanks for that answer, it's a good answer. And you're right, you know, you cannot fight mother nature. So just, you gotta go with it, so. Anyway, the next one here is, uh, wasn't the San Francisco building uh, built following the earthquake rules? Uh, and if so, why is it sinking? Okay, that's a very good question. In fact, um, when I went to visit the building last, there was a plaque on the building that said, uh, this building complies with the seismic code, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and in other words, the building was designed and approved for uh, you know, the standard earthquake protection following the seismic codes in the uh, international building code. So basically the answer is yes, it actually met the earthquake codes at the time. Why is it sinking? Well, you could have an earthquake, okay? Your building is still standing. Therefore, your building is following the, the earthquake codes, but the building's leaning and sinking. And uh, is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem, but it's not related to the the seismic protection, it's something different. So it's kind of hard to follow, but the, the building, if there's a big earthquake, is the building gonna fall down? The answer is no, the building is not gonna fall down because it met the earthquake requirements in the building code. Is the building gonna sink and tilt? Yes, it has been, although it still followed the uh, seismic codes you know, at the time the building was built. So. You may think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it, it does, because if there's an earthquake, the building's not gonna fall down. That's the main purpose of the seismic code so that there's no uh, racking, uh, sliding, and all of a sudden the whole building falls over. So the earthquake protection is there, but apparently there's some loopholes in the seismic protection versus the building sinking and falling. So if you talk to seismic engineers, they're gonna say, yeah, the building actually conforms to the code, but 
the earthquake codes don't protect a building from sinking or tilting, right? It, it does in a certain degree, but not as like the Millennium Tower. So by the way, that sign is still there and it could be argued. If you go to the city uh, of San Francisco building department, it says, you know, your code can't be correct because you guys approved the building permit and look, the building's tilting and sinking and they're gonna tell you, uh, did it fall over? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, then it met the, the seismic codes. So basically that's what's going to happen. So although the earthquake seismic codes are there for a reason, they're, they're, they're not there like uh, designing a building to prevent it from sinking and, and tilting the way that the Millennium Tower has been. So there's it's actually two different things, although for the most part, it may sound pretty much the same yeah so hopefully that gives the answer to that question yeah that sounds good you really sounds like you need both things and yeah, this in this case yeah right um yeah the the next question here uh, maybe you've answered it but I'll, I'll ask them do you think that the millennium tower is going to collapse similar to the florida building near miami okay um the answer is no and, and here's the reason. The Florida building, uh, the one that collapsed, and by the way, it, I also did a webinar and I have a special website uh, if you're interested and it's uh, called floridabuildingcollapse.now.site. If you go there, I have uh, media interviews, videos on there. I did two webinars uh, on it. And uh, back to the question, so the answer is no. The reason why is because the Florida building, uh, you know, it was an older building, was not properly maintained. They had major concrete foundation problems uh, due to spalling. Um, it was near the ocean and they had uh, a lot of uh, conditions that are conducive to living near the ocean. And what happens is when you have a lot of salt air, it, it and, and when it penetrates through the concrete. And if you don't paint your building, there's no protection. So it's sort of like if you have a, a car that you don't paint, and now all of a sudden you see rust because the metal's bare, okay, similar. So if your building is not painted, your concrete building is not painted, what happened is moisture gets into the concrete because concrete is porous, right? It acts as a sponge, believe it or not. And when the uh, moisture hits the reinforcing steel, hits the rebar, now the rebar starts corroding. When the rebar corrodes, it expands like seven times the size. And when it expands, what does it do? It cracks the concrete. That's called spalling when the rebar expands, cracks the concrete, and now you have these cracks in the concrete of your building, that's a spalling condition. That's major, that's structural, okay? So the Florida building, and I've looked at probably over a 1, thousand, 1500 photos of the Florida building, and there were major structural problems. And that was the cause of the collapse. The cause of the collapse was due to spalling, concrete spalling. To me, um, that was number one. And then the other contributing factors are maybe uh, poor design and construction. Okay, But uh, I would say that the building should have been fixed years ago. And if it was, maybe it wouldn't have fallen down. Okay, So the, the message is, Get your buildings fixed if you have these conditions. And it was known. It wasn't something like, oh, the owners didn't know about it. So that was a Florida building. That's why it collapsed and fell down. Now, let's talk about the Millennium Tower. The Millennium Tower building is fairly new. It's not made of all concrete like the Florida building. You have a lot of glass. And um, I didn't see any, any spalling conditions, I did see cracks, but the cracks that I saw were indicative of the conditions uh, of sinking and, and leaning and tilting. That's the cracks that I saw. So those cracks are different from a spalling crack. So that building is not going to collapse because of a spalling condition. 
okay? And it's not gonna collapse because of uh, uh, poor seismic design or even poor engineering design, poor construction and engineering. It's not gonna collapse and fall over like the Florida building, okay? It can be fixed and the fix is ongoing now. If I fly to San Francisco today, I would observe the concrete pilings, you know, being being installed. So the more that they do that, the more mitigation, the more safer the building is and, you know, to prevent it from, you know, falling, leaning, tilting or sinking even further. That's not to say that the sinking and tilting and leaning is going to stop. But hopefully, after they install all the 52 concrete foundation piles, hopefully it will stop and they will see some uh, adjustment. But all tall high rise buildings are built, designed to move. They're not designed to stay in one place. The reason for the design is as you get higher and higher in upper floors, there's a wind factor. Okay, so. On a lower floor, it's not as windy. On a higher floor, it, it is windy and it's windier. So if you have like a, a trade wind, let's say of 10 miles an hour on the bottom of a building, let's talk, say it's a 40 story high rise building and you have a trade wind on the, on the bottom of the building, on the, uh, the ground floor, okay, of 10 miles an hour. I go up on the rig to 28th floor, I go up to the 40th floor, that wind is probably uh, two and a half. So it could be 20 miles per hour or 25 miles per hour. So that's the higher you go, the more the wind is, right? The more velocity the wind is. Case in point, um, there was uh, on the bottom of this building, the wind was about 15 miles per hour. And it's like, you know, not, not that windy. I go up on the rig to inspect and it was like 35 miles an hour on the 26th floor. And you know what I did? I had to tell the workers, let's go down. It's just too, too dangerous. When, when the wind is so strong and the gust is coming at 40 miles per hour and it's, it's causing your, your rig to crash into the building, that's not a safe condition, right? So uh, we went down and I called it a wind day. So, you know, when you're doing construction work and it's raining, you can call it a rain day. If it's snowing, you call it a snow day and you're going, okay, everybody go home. But there's such a thing as a wind day. And that's what I did. I was a construction manager and I, I called it. I said, we're calling, I'm calling a wind day. Everybody go home, put it in your log. It's too windy and it's unsafe. So. Uh, that's what happened. But I kind of uh, veered off the trail, but uh, hope, hopefully I answered uh, the question. Yes, you did. You answered all the questions that I have here, either on Zoom or, uh, let's see, on Facebook. Oh, yeah, there's just some comments about the force of the wind. Yeah. But uh, I don't see any other questions. Okay, well, good. Then we can we can wrap up. Um, and th this is this is pretty interesting for me. Uh, this webinar because I've been following this story for for years. And when I go to San Francisco, I actually go and and visit the the job site and try to talk to people and to get more information. So you know, I'm happy to share the first sand information. Although I can tell you, I tried to stand by the front door and interview people that came out and people just didn't want to talk about it. I'm like, hey, I'm an engineer. I got a couple questions about the building. Oh, I don't have time. To... One, one guy was like in a rush. Another lady looked nice. She was walking her dog and she said, oh no, I, I don't have any comment. And I'm going, geez, these people are like uh, people in New York sometimes. But I did not see Joe name it. If I did, I would have said, hey, you know, Joe, you actually made a mistake because, uh, you know, you should should have let Martin and I buy the unit because <laughs> then you wouldn't have to sue, right? They would be stuck with this building. But anyway, um, yeah, it's fun for me to give firsthand information. And all my webinars are based on firsthand information over my uh, past 42 years of experience working in 
the construction industry and sharing my knowledge and expertise. And I'm doing that to, to help the cause, help people, because if, if you know, any of you uh, are able to use my information to help you, you know, better yet, we're happy. And uh, which leads me to uh, plugging, I'm giving a webinar on contra contractor bidding avoid the ripoff. And if you ever work with a contractor or plan to in the future, please attend the webinar because I got stories that with one sentence that you put in a contract, I've saved $25,000 plus for homeowners. And it doesn't matter if you're a homeowner, a condo unit owner, you're a developer, or you're trying to renovate uh, in our office building or something, it all applies. Everything that I tell you would, would apply in this case because you know, you're gonna hire a contractor. It doesn't matter if it's a general contractor, uh, engineering contractor, or a specific specialty contractor. And the difference is a general contractor would handle all everything to do with a building. For, for instance, a Millennium Tower, the general contractor is a contractor that's a prime contractor. He's the number one contractor that's in charge of everything. A specialty contractor is a contractor who the general contractor would hire. And let's say he comes in and only does electrical work or he only does plumbing work or he's a window glass contractor. That's all he does. He does nothing else or a drywall contractor, paint air, ceramic tile or whatever. There's, you know, could be a hundred different specialty contractors on the job. So uh, if you look into to get helpful tips and save money in dealing with contractors, and you know, I'm not saying all contractors are bad. I'm just saying if you do your due diligence and protect yourself, then you know, if the contractor is honest and good, better yet. If the contractor is not so honest, these things that, that I'm gonna give you tips could you know, help save you from grief, agony, and losing thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I got good stories to tell. So hopefully you'll tune in. And by the way, um, Martin and I really appreciate you guys attending. It's fun for us. We're having fun. If we didn't have any fun, we wouldn't be doing this because nobody's paying us to do it, right? So, you know, we just like to give back to the community and help and whatever we, we can. So once again, thank you guys for attending, uh, especially guys that are from foreign countries. And I like to say, uh, aloha, mahalo. Uh, if you don't know what mahalo is, it means thank you in Hawaiian. And I don't know, you know what the word is in, in, India, in, in India. So I, I gotta read up on these things. So you know, we're able to to talk different languages, I guess, but I barely can speak English. So anyway, uh, thank you guys for attending and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Aloha.